Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, Sport Gisborne Tai Rafiti and the R Poverty Bay Rugby Union would like to present tonight a member of the New Zealand rugby executive team responsible for the day-to-day -day running of rugby at NZRU. Okay, a member of the, um, the New Zealand rugby executive team, he took on the role of All Blacks manager in 2004 after four years with the Crusaders, during which time that, that team made every super final and won the competition twice. He served as manager of the Canterbury in New Zealand NPC side from 1999 and managed the New Zealand A during their tour of France, Wales and Romania in 2000. He has previously served as a marketing manager with tourism pioneers AJ Hackett Bungie. His outstanding All Black record of three draws, 19 losses, 184 wins. Welcome Darren Sheen, All Blacks manager. Uh, good day, everyone. How are you going? Good. Yeah. Bit of overstated. Welcome there. I hate all that stuff about me. Yeah, it's awful. Uh, I'm actually from Hawke's Bay, so I'm pretty close to you guys. I was born in the Bay. I think the last time I was in Gisborne, I think I was 17, playing cricket at uh, Harry Barker Reserve against Campion College. I went to St John's in uh, Hastings, so I uh, kind of feel like I'm amongst the brothers here. So um, it's cool to be here. Um, and just, uh, tonight I just, um, just want to share a little bit about uh, the All Blacks and more particularly I just want to talk a little bit about um, how you go about winning Rugby World Cups because um, uh, we managed to do that a couple of times and uh, so that's our day job, just getting the business done up there. Uh, but to get to that point we had to go through some hard times as well and um, yeah, I was unfortunately involved in the 2007 campaign where we uh, lost in the quarterfinals so, but you know, in, in hindsight Everything we learnt from 2007 served us really well uh, when we, we prepared for 2011 and then for 2015. So I'm um, just going to share some thoughts, some ramblings, some uh, ideas, things that worked, things that didn't. Hopefully a couple of stories will come into my head as we go. And uh, then I think there's some time for a few questions and uh, it's pretty much open season for questions. So I'll take them all. I might have to sidestep a few if I don't know the answer, but that's what we do. So here we go. Um, so Rugby World Cups, one of the things we learn is they're just they're really different from what we do every day and um, they're really unique I suppose. Um, normally we just play test matches and you guys all want us to win all those games and we go to World Cup and we're supposed to win all those games but it's just different. Um, it's just a different setup. You, you go and you play pool matches, sometimes you're playing you know, teams like Georgia, Portugal, Romania, you know, everyone expects you to beat them by 100 points so it's quite hard. Um, to, to get yourself in the right mental space and then you get to a point where you have to win because if you don't, you're on the plane home and we don't have that every year. You know, we just play a Bledisloe Cup three times against Australia. If we win two, we've won it and the third one's dead, you know. So uh, if we lose it, you guys get a bit upset uh, and we carry on and play another game but we don't have to get sent home. So it's totally different. So that was one of the really important things for us to understand and between 87 when Captain Kirk uh, held the cup and 2011 was 20, what, 24 years I think. It's a long time for everyone to wait. <laughs> so um, yeah. So one of the things we did learn was that um, at World Cups teams produce really you know heroic performances. Um, you guys remember that game, 215, Japan up over South Africa. We were uh, we'd just come back from training and we went and we we're in a hotel in London and um, it was on the big screen. All the boys were sitting there, were just like. Go the Jeffs, go the Jeffs, you know? and it was even though the South Africans we've got a lot of respect for, but that's sort of World Cups, you know. It's just you get those crazy upsets, and um, and look look at our record with the French, eh? 99, 207. Just people just get up uh, at a level that you just don't expect, and so that was our big learning, particularly around 207. We just got to be ready for that because someone out of nowhere will just on that day produce a performance that that we just won't be expecting. Yeah, so uh, we, um, we really struggled after 207, as you can imagine, because um, our jobs were on the line, um, and it was really hard to go back and watch that game. Um, I still haven't actually watched that game ever <laughs> since that day, but we did have to understand what happened. Um, do you remember that grey jersey? Yeah, Messe, that was my fault, so you can slap me about that one, but we'll never wear grey again. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that right now. So Brian Lahore said to me, uh, don't ever get grey again. So I said, yes sir. 
never get grave. But, um, you know, in the end, when we, we made some mistakes, um, if you talk to Sir Graham Henry, he'll just tell it was the referee's fault. Uh, but there was a lot of other things that, um, that we learned through, through failure and learned through defeat. And uh, as I say, even in 2015 and preparing for that tournament, we went right back and looked again at those lessons in 2007 um, because going into London, uh, we'd never won a World Cup outside of New Zealand. So there's some good parallels with what, how we failed in, in 2007, if you like. A little story in, uh, in 2011, uh, 2007, so we, we lost to the French in uh, the changing room. We weren't playing in Wales, actually, and the changing room was like a morgue. It was just awful place, like just men crying, you know, it was just, I hated it. I just had to get out, like I just walked out the door. I stood out in the corridor and uh, at the Millennium Stadium, it's a really long corridor, and I was just standing there uh, having a moment, and uh, I saw these guys walking down to the changing room, all in suits. Um, the front guys had like the earpieces in, like security. And there was a guy in the middle of the group, small guy, in a suit, didn't recognise him. And they walked up to the door, and uh, the first guy spoke to me, it was sort of French accent, and said, oh, you know, can we come into the changing room? And as I said, I didn't recognise the people they were with. Anyway, at the back of the group was a French guy that I knew. He was an um, Olympic gold medalist, a skier, a guy called Antoine Denerius. And he's married to a Kiwi girl, um, Claudia Riegler, who I used to ski with uh, in my Queenstown days. And uh, Antoine is like, when I said no, his face sort of dropped. And he's calling me over, bro, come over here, come over here. I have to tell you something. I said, OK. I walked up and he goes, that man in the middle of the circle of security guards, that's the French president, Mr. Sarkozy. I think you better let him in. <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> You're not coming in. We're sore losers today. No, it was not the case, but it was uh, yeah, one of those sad days where you, you know, don't recognise a world leader. Anyway, we'll move on. How am I going, Derek? Okay, thanks. My mentor. Um, I talked a little about this earlier. One of the things that we learned out of uh, the failure in preparing for World Cups was that we kind of became the victims of our own success. So, you know, we played for the Bledisloe Cup. Back then we used to play for the Tri-Nations, now the Rugby Championship, and that's a different sort of series. It's not like World Cups. But we, we went into 2007 thinking we'd just take that template we were winning all the time and we'll just put it into a World Cup and that'll work. But it was different. We didn't really understand. So... Um, that was a you know, huge, huge learning for us. And, and in 11 and 15, we, we had quite different sort of planning and, uh, and campaign plans, if you like, to make sure that we treated the World Cup really differently and we took different mindset into it and that sort of thing. So it was a really important lesson for us. Um, anyone recognise that moment on the, on the far right there, that guy clutching uh, down there? Yes, that was Dan Carter in 211. Um, so I think it was the Thursday before we played Canada in the last pool game. He'd just been made all-black captain and he, he um, tore his groin. Um, and the other pictures of the Springboks in um, 2004, uh, 2007 at the World Cup. So what I'm talking about here is sometimes you need things to go wrong right in the middle of campaigns just to keep you on track. And uh, sometimes you can manufacture it. Uh, and sometimes it just happens. Um, and so, for example, just recently I've been doing a little bit of work with uh, Emirates Team New Zealand, the Yachties. And so this week, you know, they've had um, someone crashed into them. Uh, they've got some stuff stuck on their um, thing under the boat. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, I'd just, and I'd talk to them about the same thing. You know, you've got to, the adversity is good because it keeps you sharp in, in high performance events and you know, pinnacle events like Olympics that you need to be sharp, you just, Mr. Complacency, he's not allowed in the house. You've just got to be sharp and really on the button. And So um, one of the things we learned in 2007 was everything just went really well. You know, we just, everything was just pitch perfect. Um, but then we got to the game and it didn't happen for whatever reason, it just didn't work. So um, it was great that Dan tore his groin because that, <laughs> that got everyone really sharp and eventually that led to Beaver turning up and, you know, being the hero. So, and DC just wore the tracksuit for the week. So, um, the Springboks in 2007 and 2006, we went and played them up in Pretoria where the Bulls play. And um, you know, that's at the High Veld and it's, it's difficult up there. And 
It's a lot easier now for New Zealand teams because we've been doing a lot, but this is 10 years ago. It was a little harder, and uh, we put 50 points on them, and they were in disarray. Like, they were just a mess. Um, but, you know, look, and a, a year later, they, they, they gathered together. They got something that really held them tight, and they won the World Cup in, in 2007. So sometimes when things go wrong, it actually helps you in terms of preparing a team. And uh, even in a business, you know, you could be trucking along nicely, but sometimes you just need to put that little bit of adversity in just to uh, keep people uh, uh, right where they need to be. Yeah, so getting the right people on your bus is really important. Um, I love that picture of Beaver because it, I mean, I, I want an honesty call here. I want 10 out of 10 honesty from you guys. So in 2011, when, when we called up Beaver to the All Blacks to play in the World Cup final, who was really nervous? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> exactly. And what about the other guy there? Who was really nervous heading into 2015 that Dan Carter was no longer the man? Come on, honest. Oh, okay, you're from Canterbury. <laughs> But like, it's so, like, what, what we have the privilege of doing every day is really understanding these men and knowing uh, when it really matters that they're going to do the job. And like, Beaver was so loved by the boys. Like, there was huge trust for him as a person. And that's really important in a team, that there's that sense of that I can trust this guy to do the job. Like, he, he's not the most, he'll admit it, he's not the most gifted uh, and talented athlete, but uh, what he does do, he does the best he can. And that's all the boys... And the All Blacks, that's all we ask. You come in, you're given a job, you do it the best you can. Because, the, you know, the good news is there's 14 other guys doing the same thing, and they're pretty good too. And so that's how it works, as simple as that. Uh, so, uh, and I guess in Dan's case, uh, we always knew that on the big occasions, he was going to front. And so I wouldn't say he was going through the motions during pool play, because <laughs> that's not fair, but... Um, you know, once we got to quarterfinals, he was a different man wandering around the hotel than he'd been the first four weeks. And you could see it in his eyes, and you could feel that he was ready to, you know, ready to be the player that we all knew he could be. So, um, yeah, selections, it's everything. You get it wrong, uh, and, and we've certainly experienced that over the time I've been there. Then um, it can not only kill the team, but it can kill the performance too. So it's something you've got to pay a lot of attention to. Anyone know that, that clown in the orange <laughs> shirt? <laughs> no, no. My old mate, Wayne Barnes. So um, in business, there's a saying, that they talk about behaviour, you're either above the line or you're below the line. All right? If you're above the line, that's really good because you generally you take responsibility for things. All right? and, and that's great, and you take accountability. But if you're below the line, it's not a good place because you tend to blame people, you make excuses, you deny things happened, and you avoid doing things. Okay? Below the line, not a good place. Well, after 2007, uh, Graham Henry, myself, Wayne Smith, Steve Hansen, we were below the line for about two years <laughs> on that guy. <laughs> it was all his fault. <laughs> That's why we lost. All because of you, Barnsey. And um, then Graham spent, I think, two weeks watching the game and came back to me and he said, I can't believe it, you know? These stats, I've never, ever seen them in 150 years of coaching, you know? And he was just convinced that it was Barnsey's fault. But the right thing, in the end, we kind of got past that. Um, I remember in two, two oh, early 2009 we played South Africa in Cape Town and um, Barnsley was one of the assistant referees and he, I was standing outside the door um, to bring the refs in to meet the, the front row before the game and uh, he walked past and I didn't say anything. He said, are you going to ever talk to me again? <laughs> I go, no, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all good now. He's okay. But I think what we learned out of that actually became a really good lesson for us is that we said, how, how, do, we, how do we get better at working with referees? You know, like, we, we can't control how the referee is going to referee the game. That's out of our control. But what can we learn and how can we be better in terms of uh, getting the ref working more in our favour? So we went away and we came up with some ideas. And we, in the end, we did sort of, we profiled referees and really tried to understand them as people, to understand their mindset, what, what they really what the approach is to the game, how they think about the game. Uh, we then looked at their sort of skills, so particularly how do they referee the line out, the scrum, the breakdown. So we really started to build a picture of who they were and, and how they would behave under pressure. And then we developed our own ideas. Um, so for example, we would give Richie, would say this is the way you need to talk to this ref, these are the best times to do it. Tell Jimmy Cowan never to talk to him because you don't like him, you know, <laughs> or something like that. But we built, we built all that. And, um, I got the most pleasure about uh, 
a year and a half after that, we're in the UK in this newspaper over there. It's called Independent. It's one of the big daily newspapers. Um, and it, um, the article was something like, all blacks have referees on their side, you know? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> this is working really well. And uh, we didn't have to give them any gold watches or anything. We just had to just think about ways of, um, you know, being responsible for the referees and, and us understanding how they were. So just a, a good example. A second example, uh, that pic the other picture of the line-out, that's at the 2015 Rugby World Cup. Uh, that's us playing South Africa. And if you, if you roll back about five or six years, we went over there and we lost three matches in a row. I think it was 2009. They had, I uh, remember, Victor Matfield. Yeah, not too bad a player. And there was another big guy called Bucky's Botha. And they, they just killed us in the lineouts for quite a few years. We, just, we were no match for them. Um, poor old Steve Hansen was coaching the forwards in the lineouts at that stage. And um, the media got right under his collar and annoyed him. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, was, it was tough times. But in the end, we could just sit there and blame, blame or make excuses. We could do all that. But we had to decide to take ownership. And around 210, Kieran Reid came into the side and Sam Whitelock. And they just had a different outlook on it because they hadn't been caught up in the Victor thing. So they, they did stuff like, they started to learn Afrikaans, so they'd know the calls. They uh, started to study Victor's body language, started to look for cues and lineouts. Um, with video analysis, you can do frame by frame by frame. So we started to work out the speed that they threw the ball into the lineout, so we could teach our hookers to throw it faster, and all these sort of things. And um, you fast forward to this World Cup, and the first, uh, Victor was on the bench, he came on with 20 to go, so in the first 60 minutes, I think there was 12 lineouts, eight hours, four of theirs. We won all of them. They brought Victor on to save the day. First lineout, Sam yells at him in Afrikaans. Victor's face just goes completely red, and uh, and we Sam stole it, and we won the rest of the lineouts in the game as well. That were all his. So you can just see when you really take responsibility for something, forget all the other rubbish around it, that you can you know you can do great things. And that was again just a, a simple example you can apply to sport business or life it's it's a really easy thing I love when I see people below the line I just love going how's life down there bro <laughs> you know come on get above and it's it's just simple language but um, it's good it's good language you know and it's important in a, in a high performing team like ours just going to wrap up with a few sort of guiding principles things that we apply now all the time that we learn from uh, those those three campaigns if you like uh, really simple but first priority and anything is to get your game right. So whatever your game is in business or sport, just focus on the game like that. Know your game. Um, I work for AJ Hackett Bungie um, in Queenstown, and um, it was a really it was a, like an ex a company that just exploded from nowhere. Um, and I remember we'd only be going like a year and a half. Um, so the first six weeks when we opened the Bungie. Uh, it was a little bit risky, you know? No one really knew what bungee jumping was. And suddenly here you had to pay 100 bucks to jump off a bridge with a rubber band. And there's these crazy fools like me helping you do it. Uh, and we used to just, at the end of the day, we had a, a school desk, the old wooden one with the inkwell, lift up the lid. Some of you might remember. And um, we used to have a cash bag there. We just put the money in there. End of the day, we all got paid uh, 50 cents a jumper, I think. And we're doing about 400 a day, so it was good, good coin when you were 20. And um, the rest of the money, AJ just used to go down the pub and we'd drink it. And we'd, we only had a license for six weeks, so it was just like, let's have a bit, it was just have a bit of fun. Um, but eventually we had to get serious and, and get it right. But like within a year, things just went crazy. We, we got a license for 99 years. Uh, we, we'd proven that it was safe and we had good standards and we weren't going to kill anybody. Uh, and next thing, AJ's just jetting all around the world, learning to set them up everywhere. And he's, he's, he's buying jet boats and rafts because he wants to just be the tourism king, you know. And a couple of years later, someone else set up a bigger bridge, like twice as high, and our, we lost half our client base overnight because we didn't stick to our game, you know. And so it's really, really important to know your game, stick to your knitting, and do it really well. So in an all-black week, if you come into our environment, the most of the, of the week we spend training about the game, <laughs> You know, that's the most important thing. We've got to get our line out, all right. We've got to get our scrum right. Our defence has got to be top notch. Uh, we've got to get our, our mental side right, and you just got to get the game right. Um, I know you'll, you probably read or hear. You know, there's 20 staff, and we pamper them. It's just rubbish. You know, we, we don't. We work them really hard because 
they go into a theatre with high expectation, high scrutiny, high confidence, and um, we've got lots of experts that can help them, but the players drive the program, not the experts. We're there to support what they need. So um, the players are, that one of the, the key things in our environment is that we build players that are really capable of dealing, playing under pressure. And so all the, the role of us as, as staff is to give them the tools so they can go out and do that. Because once they're out there, uh, we're powerless. We, we can't do anything, our job's done. And in fact, in a week from Sunday to Saturday, the, the, the management and the coaching staff, we might lead the environment for the first couple of days till about Tuesday, but then we hand the leadership over to the players completely. It's their job, so um, a, a, an important uh, thing for us in, in the Uh So this slide's about, the key word there's the first one, and uh, again in business or in sport, the people that lead and the people that help, it's really important that you're connected and you're together and you're on the same page. Uh, it's like you've got to all be in the waka and paddle in the same direction and that's, that's been a big difference maker for us uh, all the way through. We have a leaders group, we have about nine players, uh, they meet with the, uh, with the sort of senior management team and we, we drive the bus together, we make all our decisions together, uh, we walk out the room, we, we believe in what we're doing together and uh, we'll own that together. So really important part of any business. Leadership's changed, you know. I guess leadership um, has changed, but it's still required, you know. Uh, what do they say in leadership? In, in leadership, everything has changed and nothing has changed. <laughs> and what's changed is in, in the past, we used to prescribe and we used to direct. Now we empower. It's a completely different way of, of leading. And, uh, and certainly in the All Blacks, we know we've got to have 15 guys that lead in their own ways. They can lead by leading themselves and being really ready to play and then we've got others that are going to have to lead them and direct them uh, during the game but um, it, it's, it's really important that the, the whole group uh, collectively lead and have a vision to lead and that they're all connected and on the same page. Uh, yeah, just, I guess I kind of talked about this now but we hand the ownership to the players because uh, we need those, you know, those chain bonds to be really, really strong and um, management are there around the side supporting because uh, in that, in that theatre where they're playing, they're the ones that are, that are driving it, the performance side of things. I think uh, in our environment, uh, sometimes it's a little bit hard to have fun, you know, because we've got the whole world watching us. Um, every day I ask myself the question, will that activity pass the Sunday morning paper test, you know? <laughs> because we are, we're really, and so we, we've got a, um, We've got to build things in our environment where we can sort of let go and be ourselves. And, and so certainly the picture on the right is a bit about that. We, we do a thing called the club rooms once a week. We put on our club jerseys and it's like, like the club rooms. We have a club captain, we have a raffle. We do all that sort of thing. The boys talk about their clubs, uh, about the history and uh, occasionally we've invited guests and various crazy people come and talk to us. So it's, it's really good. I think the second thing, uh, you know, kapaka has become a really important part of of the identity of the All Blacks and, and understanding it, really understanding it, what it means, uh, the unique things about being a Kiwi um, and our connection with the land and with the people. And obviously Derek had a, a massive role in helping us with that way back in 2005 with Kapa Opongo. But um, it's, it's um, I still, when I watch that clip in Dunedin, you know, just feel so proud, you know, of what, uh, what the group accomplished with Derek's leadership to produce something that was really unique for us, and uh, and to this day we're still you know still trying to grow it and develop it and understand more, uh, and sometimes you need something greater than the team to really bind you together, and uh, I think we're really lucky here because we have we have that. Other, I don't think other teams in the world have that uniqueness or that real understanding of their ethnicity and their culture, uh, because that becomes a big part of our performance as well. Um, yeah, sometimes I worry the boys get a little bit wound up, hey? <laughs> but we think we've, you know, the, the thing I've never been able to figure out, every country we go to, they try and figure out a psychological ploy to stop us getting an advantage by doing the haka. And what they don't realise, they're dumb, man, they're so dumb. They don't realise that when they give us a minute after we've done the haka for them to do something, that just lets us, you know, just come back to earth and uh, think about the fact that the game's going to start and we've got to play. You know, and uh, they, in Australia, they used to have a guy come out, play a banjo and sing, we'll sing Matilda, and it was great. We just get in the huddle, we'll talk about what we're going to do for the first couple of minutes, and 
because you've got to play a game next, you know? That's uh, the thing, you've got to be back in that, that, that mind of I've got a job to do and I'm, I'm just going to get on with it. So anyway, I'll move on. Uh, so uh, the picture on the right, uh, Malachi Fekatoa. This, this slide's all about motivation. And um, at the Rugby World Cup in 2015, we played seven games. Seven uh, matches, 80 minutes, that's 560 minutes. Is that right? Any teachers here? <laughs> uh, at that stage, we'd only played uh, six games, so this is the week of the final. Malachi and that whole whole tournament had only played 20 minutes of rugby. Over seven weeks in the UK, it had 20 minutes of rugby. So he's just doing a personal best squat. Uh, hands up if you think he's motivated. Yeah, I think he's pretty motivated. <laughs> Yeah, so um, that, that's sort of the ethos we try and build in our team. You know, whether you're one, player one to 15 who gets to wear the jersey to start, or whether you're 16 to 23, you've all got a role. Whether you're 24 to 33 like he was, you've still got a role. Um, in rugby, there used to be the term the dirty duties. You know, and that used to be licensed to have a week off. Uh, that's, that's, that's the old the old way. And the All Blacks, all 33 prepare the same. And... Um, we used this clip uh, a few years ago with some of our young players to trying to get them to understand that's one of the key, um, the key things in our environment, that we're all prepared to play. We treat everyone the same in terms of their preparation. But in the cricket and the Ashes, Australia were playing England. And um, remember Glenn McGrath? The, yeah, that guy. Um, so he, he rolled his ankle on the morning of the test and they had to call in a, another guy that morning, literally five minutes before um, Australia went out to, to field in England with the bat. And the, the bowler, uh, a guy called Michael Kasselbritz, came into the side. And that morning, in the morning session, he took five wickets. Had England on the ropes. At lunchtime, they interviewed him and they said, look, you know, how, how, do you, how do you prepare for something like that? He said, I've been preparing all week. And, and I guess that's sort of, we took those lessons into our environment and we want everyone to you know, prepare to that level. That other clown on the left, is, uh, anyone know who that is? Brad Thorne. Yeah, he's a bit of a clown. I, um, had a bit to do with him. Um, when he first changed from the Broncos to rugby, he came to Canterbury, and um, I got to meet Wayne Bennett a few days before it happened, and uh, so I just want to ask him a little bit about the man and get a better understanding of what Thorny was about. And so Thorny arrives at Rugby Park in Christchurch, and uh, it's quite intimidating. He's a big, big fellow, and I'm just a little squirt. And, so we walk in, and the first building in at the Canterbury Rugby base was the physio room. So, uh, yeah, Thorny, this is our medical room. I won't be going in there. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Just show me the gym. Off we go to the gym. and uh, He used to also, really annoying in team photos, uh, have you seen a, a standard photo? You've got everyone sitting on the chairs in the front row, and then behind you have all the, uh, the tall players, the locks, and they normally have to stand, you know, right over left. I'd get the photo back, have to proof it, and here's Thorne with his other arm over the front, like left over right, only one. Thorne, come here. What's, what's with this? You know, everyone else is right over left. We're a team, aren't we? You're left over right. What's going on? He goes, it's my biggest one. <laughs> Final story on Thorne. He's in Brisbane, so I'm safe here in Gisborne. Uh, we used to get, well obviously we get quite a bit of kit, you know, we're really lucky our sponsors provide us a bit of kit and um, one year we got a jacket, a puffer jacket, like a, a down jacket, had no sleeves on it. We laid all the bags out, players came in to pick up their bags, trying it on. Uh, we had a, I was in a meeting room and just off to the side of the meeting room was a little uh, room where our gear man used to hang out. So Thorne's putting his stuff on, he puts his puffer jacket on and strolls over to myself and the, and the kit man, he says, ah, oh, this jacket's too big. So I took it off and had a look, it was 2XL. Oh, Thorne, you're a big man, you know, you need that. You're always telling me about, he used to call his chest big and bigger. So you know, you've got to get it over big and bigger. And he said, no, no, it's too small, uh, too big. I said, okay, took him out the back. We only had a large left. He goes, that'll be fine. Takes his suit off, he loves showing off, took it off. Puts this thing on, he's like holding everything in, sort of gives a zip this one, and then the arms just like explode out the side of it. At, by this stage, everyone was in the meeting room set up for a team meeting. He strolls out of the, uh, the kit room like this. <laughs> That's what we call a set of guns. <laughs> Sits down. That's the side of Bradthorn you don't know about. But, um, but one of the most self-motivated 
players we ever had. Uh, he's still trying to play professional rugby now at 42. Um, but, you know, he lost his dad really young, and I think his dad always just said to him, you know, if you work harder than everyone else, you'll get the rewards. Um, let's just get sick of, you know, waiting for Thorne at the end of training to finish training <laughs> when everyone else has already had a shower and, you know, had dinner and gone home. He's still out there. Uh, he used to always, he was notorious for um, keeping Dan Carter out there having goal kicking competitions. He never won them, but he just thought he was a good kicker. But six foot five hundred and twenty five kgs just doesn't quite do it the same as Carter could. But a uh, good, yeah, a good character and a pretty special man. Uh, another big principle for us is just the whole notion of, an, of innovation, and um, you've got to keep sandpapering away and finding new ways to do the same thing. I think um, the picture on the left. Uh, few years back the game sort of changed and it was all about high kick and our wingers uh, couldn't catch, couldn't even catch a cold let alone a rugby ball so um, we spent a lot of time, we developed that pad there, it's called the turtle. Um, if you get to put it on it's like you know having a turtle shell on your back. Not a good job but I'm um, sure plenty of people put their hand up to spend a week with us holding the turtle. But, uh, so guys run forward and practice you know good technique for high ball catch. Um, some of the other initiatives we've worked on, neck strength, you know, for to help with concussion and things like that. But I guess the message is, you know, you've just got to, you've got to keep innovating. You've got to keep thinking. We have a fantastic group of people that, uh, like, like Professor Wayne Smith, he, he sends about 20 pages of new ideas every day. <laughs> you just got to keep filtering through them. Um, but that's in a, in a high performance environment where it really matters. You've got to keep filtering through stuff and, and find other ways to do things. Uh, final slide's really about pressure and uh, we, uh, when I f uh, first got involved with the All Blacks and we started to, uh, with, with Sir Graham Henry and, and the people I was working with back then, we, we felt the players found the All Black environment uh, really heavy and they really felt the expectation and they didn't enjoy it. And so we had to figure out a way that pressure actually became their friend rather than their foe. Um, the old All Black book, um, back in the Zinzan Brook, Sean Fitzpatrick days, it was all about fear, you know, don't let the country down, all that sort of stuff. And that, that worked really well for that group, but for the men we deal with, that just didn't resonate. You know, we just had to find other ways. And so slowly over time, and, and look, Gilbert and Oak has been a huge part of this, this journey for us, is understanding that pressure can be your friend. You know, you, you want to walk towards it, you want to enjoy the challenge of facing pressure. But in, in saying that, you've got to understand what pressure is and what it does to you and how it feels. And um, when I look at 2007 and I look at Richie out there in the middle of Millennium Stadium, <laughs> Dan Carter's gone off, uh, Nick Evans came on, he did his hamstring, he's got Luke McAllister playing number 10. I knew Richie didn't trust Luke. I knew it, you know. And he's lost, he's lost his hard man. Jerry Collins is sitting in the stand, he's hurt himself. His other leaders, Aaron Major, didn't get picked. I think Graham had a brain fade that week. No, no. <laughs> but it was just, I looked and I said, this poor kid, he, he didn't have the tools to deal with it. Great man that he is, you know, and, and what he's done now is amazing, but he probably needed to go through that too, and so did we, to learn that we, we, he just didn't have the tools to deal with pressure. We sometimes get caught up, particularly in coaching, just worried about the technical and the tactical, but a lot of it comes down to how you manage this and how you cope with it and how you deal with it. And uh, in our society now, we just dumb that down. You know, we, we, we put the umbrellas around the kids and, you know, we, we just don't let ourselves get really tested. So we've had to work really hard in that space to understand that, you know, when the pressure goes on, things happen. You know, you, you get into, you heard of fight or flight. You know, people, they get aggressive. Uh, flight is about they just disappear the game. They don't want to be involved. Eh? Or some people even just freeze. They just don't want to be involved. So once we start to understand that the brain does funny things when it's under pressure, then we could help them and we could learn. And, and in the end, I guess the end game is that you want those moments there in, in 2015. At the moment when it really mattered, he did the right thing. He made the right decision. Uh, and look, that took a lot of work to get to that point for him, but the, the emphasis was we really decided that was an important part of the game that we couldn't ignore anymore. And um, we need to provide, particularly our leaders, with the skills to cope with that and deal with that and make great decisions. Uh, the other bloke there, um, you might recognise, he, uh, he sometimes has different pressures. He has a lot of off-field pressures. Um, you know, people love him and he, he gets swamped. And at 20, uh, 2011 World Cup, the first match we played Tonga in Auckland, amazing. Just 
I think there were like 3,000 people outside the hotel the whole week. The boys just couldn't leave the hotel. It was just overwhelming, the support. It was amazing. At the end of the, uh, end of the week, we jumped in the bus. We drove down State Highway 1 to Hamilton. Wow, it's just like talk and cheese, you know? Hamilton was like tumbleweed rolling down Victoria Street. It was so quiet. And you could just feel the pressure just drop off the players. Like, it was so good. They could sort of get out of the hotel, um, you know, go and have a coffee and just not feel like they're overwhelmed and, and stuck in the hotel. Well, on the Monday of that week, I'm sitting in the hotel lobby and I see uh, Sonny Bill running across the street from the mall with his hoodie over his head, like sprinting hard out. And uh, coming to the hotel and I said, oh, what's up, bro? What have you been up to? He said, oh, I just went over to the mall. I said, oh, how was that? Ah, no good, stink. I said, oh, what happened? He said, oh, this little kid, he just followed me all the way around the mall. I said, oh, well, did you give him an autograph or something? He goes, no, I said, hey, kid, here's 10 bucks. Bugger off. <laughs> I said, oh, why are you running? He goes, oh, next thing there's 200 kids. <laughs> anyway. So I'm um, just going to wrap up because I can see the food's coming. I'm hungry. Uh, so what do we learn about World Cups and about high performance pinnacle events? Talked about that. In regards to leadership, everything has changed, but nothing's changed. Really important that you get leadership right and that you, you do it the right way. Um, <coughs> things evolve in unpredictable ways in sport. It never goes the way you think it will. You've got to be ready for that. Japan, 2015. Um, very rarely does the game follow the game plan. Uh, that's our experience, just never does. So you, you've got to be ready for it anything that's thrown at you and that's all part of getting ready to, to do the business. Um, look, sometimes you can have the most talented people but they won't necessarily become a great team and um, we're lucky eh? we get to pick the cream of the crop, we get to pick the most talented guys but sometimes you've got to make a decision about talent or character you know because character is really important in a group too so um, getting that right is, is, is hugely important. Yeah, we, we learned that the hard way, you know, when things really, the pressure really goes on, sometimes people just become individualistic. They get affected by fight or flight or freeze and they just can't cope with the pressure. And they try and do it themselves. And in a team game, that doesn't work. I said it in the All Blacks, you have a role, you do that role, you do it as well as you can and you trust the other guys to do their role and that's, that's how it works. It's as simple as that, can't explain it any, any differently. Um, yeah, a bit like that drop kick in 2015 for DC. Sometimes everything you, you do and have worked for comes down to one moment in time and you've got to get it right because everything matters. Uh, you know, Valerie, Valerie at the Olympics, <coughs> one chance or five chances to throw the shot, but you know, the one that when the girl's thrown it a bit further, she's only got one more and she's got to nail it. And everything she's done matters at that moment. And so you've got to, your people have to be ready for that. So, um, yeah, Bill Gates wrote this, the Microsoft guy, and um, so he, he reckons that success is a lousy teacher. And so in the All Blacks, we, we, we're trying to say, well, we don't believe that, because why do you have to lose to get better? And if, if you think that's true, then I, I, I disagree with that. Because I think success is about, you can have continued success, because we've shown that. We've lost four matches in the last five years. And you've just got to keep asking yourself the right questions all the time, all right? Because no performance is ever perfect. There's always things you can do better. Um, and I think one of the things that we've, that's really grown us is that with our people, don't always just look at the things they don't do well. Try and grow them with the things that they do really well and take them from being exceptional at that to world class. Um, one of the, I talked to you a little bit before about that high ball catch with our wingers. So for like two years, all they did at training was practice catching high balls. And then suddenly we found they couldn't run fast. They couldn't sidestep guys and do things that wingers are supposed to do. Because they just put all the energy into their weaknesses, didn't they focus on their strengths. So um, we always use, a, we try and use an analogy of you want to work on two strengths to one weakness. And so grow those things, push them up higher, because you'll just, you'll push the person up higher and grow their potential even more. So, um, yeah, sorry Bill, I have to disagree. Um, yeah, don't look for the silver bullets. We get so much stuff presented of people with all these great ideas that are going to make us make our boat go faster. But at the end of the day, it might be a great idea, uh, but you want to test it first. You don't want to just jump, 
jump straight in. I think the key thing is that you've got a really solid bulletproof plan that everyone's bought into, everyone's aligned on, and away you go. You can play around the edges a little bit, but uh, the key thing is that you've got something that everyone's really bought into and they're really connected on. And I guess this, this sums up, this is a guy, Peter Drucker, who's another great business writer, but um, he talks about culture being so much more important than strategy. And um, you know, the core of any culture is you've got a really clear sense of purpose. You know, you might think our purpose is just to, to win games, but it's deeper than that. You know, what? we've got a much deeper purpose. We want something that just pulls us out of bed. And uh, we, want, we want people in the future to say, the All Blacks were GOAT. Do you know what that stands for? Greatest of all time. And uh, we'll never tell ourselves that we're GOAT, but that's something really aspirational. And like, it pulls me to the front of my seat when I think, gosh, this morning they're all going to look at me like I'm the GOAT manager. And I've got to be the GOAT manager, you know? I've got to be the greatest of all time. So how can I be that person? And when you've got something that drives you like that, other than just, oh, we've got to win this weekend because we get two points, it's so much stronger. And uh, then you connect that with really clear values about what it, what it means to be in, in your team. And uh, for us, you know, as an All Black, we're, we're very clear about what it means and what's expected. And uh, we hold people to that standard. We had a few slip-ups last year, you know? Poor little Aaron Smith took the wrong door at the airport. And things like that. But hey, we're not perfect, you know, and uh, we keep learning. So um, in the end, um, it's all about just building a team or an environment, if you like, that it's just the best place, you know. And that for, for me personally, that's what I'm most proud of from uh, 2004 to now is that um, this is the environment everyone wants. Like our players, by signing and staying in New Zealand, say, I want to still be here because I want to be part of the All Blacks, you know. Yeah, I can go over to France or Japan or England and I could probably double my pay but I won't have as much, I won't get as much from it as I do here and so um, we, we can't rest on our laurels about that, we, we've got we to keep working really hard to make it that way but in the end those are the moments that you want, you know, you want to be lined up there at Twickenham in 2015 ready to go, uh, like we want to be lined up in uh, Eden Park on the something of June, I can't remember the date yet when we played Lions, <laughs> I know it's soon, <laughs> so uh, yeah, hey, well, um, thanks very much. Um, I know we've got some questions later, but I appreciate your attention, and um, hopefully there's something in there for you, and I'm sure maybe you've got some questions for me later on. Cheers. Hey, so what I'm going to do, I've got a couple of questions. I've got a whole page of questions here, which I don't intend to ask, to be honest. So just to cover my backside, in case we run out of stuff. But we're really looking for people to ask some questions, because I'm sure that you come here for a reason, you want to learn something. I know the guys on the table over here, uh, from the coast, they're really keen to learn some stuff. So um, we're going to open up the floor um, for those questions. So if something comes up, let me know. And uh, Dwayne and Nick and Co are going to run around and um, with a microphone so you can ask. But uh, I thought about this. What I was going to ask, you know, I didn't know which way your presentation was going to go. It was really, really interesting, and I and I like the the, the list of points at the end which seemed to me to all come out of that 2007 World Cup. Every single one of those points, you could relate back to possibly a debrief or, or the thoughts over the next two years you guys had after that. And, and, uh, and the success, success that team's had since then has just been phenomenal. But I, I asked around, and a mate of mine, I, he's got his own business, he runs, he's got a, he's got a couple of, well, he's got more than a couple of employees, local businessmen here. And I said to him, well, what makes a good manager? And he just looked me straight in the eye and said, it's dead simple, Smithy. Good employees. It's as simple as that. I don't know if it is as simple as that, but I think it is a big factor. But what, what, what makes a good manager? Well, yeah, I'd probably say the same as I go and ask the players, you know. Yeah. Um, well, I th I think one of the things, uh, and I'll be really honest with you, is that I'm not a rugby person. I didn't come from rugby. Uh, I didn't play rugby. It's not my passion. Uh, but I, I, I want, I'm driven to be the best at what I do. And so how, that, how that's helped me is that um, I kind of don't get tied up in the emotion of it all because I, I know I've just got a role to do and I know there's a lot of expectation, a lot of people counting on me, so I've just got to do the best I can. Um, and, and I look back, um, it's interesting you say you're a policeman because it's amazing how many policemen end up in high, high positions in rugby. <laughs> I think that's the pathway actually. Uh, be a policeman, you'll end up working in the All Blacks. Um, 
But I, I go back uh, um, to when I worked in Queensland. I worked in adventure tourism, and so uh, for a while I was taking people whitewater rafting and uh, down there, and, and it gets quite extreme in the winter. And you might have a boatload of Japanese going down the shot over a river, sort of flood. You capsize, you've got eight chaps in the water, can't speak a word of English. That's real pressure, you know? That's much more pressure than, than Carter faces kicking a goal, because uh, that's life and death. And so I was really lucky because I had that time down there, same with the bungee uh, and, and working up the mountains as well. I kind of learned to cope with crisis, and that's probably the guts of our job is that things aren't always the same every day and you've got to adapt and you've got to adjust and you've got to overcome things all the time. And I remember, you remember Norm Maxwell? Yeah, the, oh, Maxie, a lovely man, he, he worked at the Crusaders and his sole goal, I think, when I was the manager was to crack, he used to say, oh, I want to crack you because I was so calm and uh, in the end he, he nicknamed me Mr. Uncrackable. <laughs> and so that's, for me, that's, uh, that's not everything, but um, it's important in my role that I'm, I'm kind of just a constant. Because um, I've got coaches that ride the up and down of emotion all the time, you know, and so they, they need they need strong support. They need a you know a strong branch behind them uh, helping them along, and that's how I see my role. I don't see myself at the front of the bus. Mm. I sort of see myself at the back of the bus, doing what needs to be done to make sure that you know the bus is the fastest bus. So, so you you started with the ABs in 2004, and you got plenty of management experience before then, and. That's not unexpected, I imagine, but but since 2007 in particular, the, the All Blacks have been dominant. And there's right throughout that whole thing, there's been consistency in players, there's been consistency in management, but also a lot of development going on in the background. So there are people coming through all the time. But through the constant talk in, the, in that is about the culture of the All Blacks, which is a really simple thing to say. But how, how, and you touched on it in your presentation, so how important is that culture? What are the, what are the key factors in developing that culture? And these are things that teams around here, are, and there's a lot of success in sport in, in, around Poverty Bay, and, and, the, and the surfing, and surf life saving, and, and kayaking, and we've got rugby players all around the world. So but what are the key things you th for you in developing a culture and what you're trying to achieve with that. Yeah, well, I, I agree. Uh, I think it's, it is the guts of it. Um, we use a simple equation, L plus C equals P. You know, P is performance, C is culture, and L is leadership. You need both those elements. You need great culture, you need great leadership, and you'll get great performance. And we, we believe, we like to keep things really simple, and so we always you know, make sure we're checking on those. But uh, with respect to culture, as I said, when we started, uh, we, we've felt it was an environment that people didn't really enjoy and it, it, it just felt wrong, like it, ha it has to be a, the best time of your life, you know, put on that jersey, it's, it's special and um, so I guess over time we've, we've set up something that works um, and I guess at the heart of it there's a, there's a few sort of key principles if you like. Um, we don't run like we call like a catch out culture. So we don't try and catch people out because we they need to grow up and be men and be responsible for themselves and everything they do because you know our vision's about guys being capable of doing things under pressure on the field. So the environment all week is about that. You've got to make your own decisions, you've got to do it under pressure and you've got to do it at a high level. And so we don't want to catch them out. We only have five rules in our environment. That's it. Be on time, wear the right clothing, do recovery. We have some rules around a couple of rules around social behaviour and that's it. Simple as that. And so we keep it really straight up and, and, and where we go, I think. So no, no, we don't try and catch people out. We really, um, we really look to get everyone contributing and thinking their own way. Um, there was this, uh, this guy, Kerry Evans, who's done a lot of work for us. You might have seen him on the Richie McCall movie. He's a very, very bright man. But he, he shared some stuff with us about uh, what he calls social loafing. So often in teams, you'll find... There was an experiment done way back in the 1900s, a tug of war experiment by a German scientist. And what he found is he put eight people on the rope and he measured, he measured the force of each individual. When he put four people on the rope, he found that four people actually put more effort in than eight people did. So if you look at, um, at rowing times, you'd think the eight would be twice as fast as the four. Well, that's not, that's not the case. Because you do get loafing in teams where people don't quite work as hard because they're part of a team. And so we completely restructured how we work because you imagine we have a leaders meeting 10 players and if Richie spoke first, 
what do you reckon the other players all said? The same thing that Richie said, because they had so much respect for the man, but that didn't help us, because I, I mean, great respect for Richie and his views, but I want to hear the other nines as well. And so we completely restructured our environment where players, they get homework before a meeting, so they bring their own ideas to the meeting rather than just so we heard Richie's ideas or, or Steve Hansen's ideas. And um, so we created this independent thinking, and, you know, and we get lots of great, good ideas coming in. You funnel it down, and you get one great idea, and that becomes the one that you focus on. Um, so that, that's another part of it. We, we constantly check on our culture. Um, there's all sorts of ways of doing that, but um, uh, we, we use this thing quite often. Um, what are we singing at? What are we humming at? What are we clunking at? You know, we just ask ourselves in our environment, what's going great, what's okay, what's not so good? And you know, culture's every day. It's not just something you write down at the start of a season and hope for the best. <laughs> it's every day, and you get tested on it every day. And uh, um, it's alive, it's a living thing, and you just constantly got to keep checking on it, make sure and it's, it's meeting uh, what you've agreed is, is the way forward. So I um, can't emphasise it enough. Oh, I could talk about culture forever, really, but uh, it's, it's the guts of, of what holds the, the group together, and you, you've got to build it. Uh, that, that suits your environment and suits the people that are in your environment. So that's interesting because for me, because you see some guys in teams, uh, I can think of a, a one All Black who who has uh, been the All Blacks now a long time. He's not a top line starting player. Um, he is constantly a Super 15 player. But there's but where he comes from, they won't pick him. And I've always sort of thought, well, that's a bit weird. Why is that? Why is that happening? So you get a so that's something about character or something like that. I'm one of those guys that um, I'm I'm a Chiefs man, so I love Stephen Donald. I got the Leave It to Be the T-shirt. I got the whole <laughs> nine yards, and he almost won them the game in Fiji, but he went off. Bad luck, but but you know, so the character of people is really really important. And so I'm wondering, and you said before, selection is everything. And so outside. The, the players have got the skills, the players have got the fitness, they've got the, maybe you can't coach speed and all that sort of stuff. But what are you looking for off the field? Do you have any input in selection about character or about your bottom lines or anything like that? And what, what are the main things to look for? Is it just straight out, that guy's good enough? Yeah, like I think I'm not a selector, so um, first and foremost, and I keep my beak out of that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not an expert in that area by any means, but you are right. Like. Um, as I said earlier, you know, we, we pick from the talent pool, we have first choice, you know, and you certainly pick on talent first, you have to. Um, but there are occasions when you've got to, what players sometimes struggle to meet the level of expectation that you have in terms of behaviour, and we, we do our research and our intel, as, as you will know, uh, in the police, and um, we find out as much as we can about them. I think what, what we really look for the most is do we think they can go from a super rugby level to an all-black level and cope with the pressures that are applied at that level? So everything's... Um, I asked Richie McCaw this question one year. I said, if you had to rank out of 10 the different pressures and intensities in, uh, in each of the environments that you play in, the three teams you play in each year, Canterbury, Crusaders and, and the all-blacks, uh, let's say all-blacks is 10 out of 10, where would the Crusaders be in terms of intensity and pressure? He said, oh, about a 7. I said, oh, what about... Playing for Canterbury and might of 10, about a 5. So that, that big shifts, like 7 to 10 is a massive shift. And Did you ask him where poverty baits at? <laughs> we can get on to Heartland. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'll give you enough. Say someone like Ryan Crotty, he's not a standout super rugby player, is he? Oh, he's a good, solid player, but he's got something. When he comes up and plays at test match level, he can do that good, solid stuff under greater pressure uh, when it really matters the most. Now... Damien McKenzie, he's a highlight reel every week at Super Rugby. You put him up in the All Blacks, he won't be a highlight reel. Not yet. He might be in time, but that's the difference. And I, like, I have a lot of admiration for the selectors because they, they've got to vicariously sort of guess that in players and, and talk to a lot of people and understand whether players have really got that, you might want to call it mental toughness or mental edge, but they've just got that capability to deal with pressure when it really matters. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about Team New Zealand. Um, so I went and spoke to him a while ago and the skipper, Glenn Ashley, said, no, I really want you to just, we'd talked a couple of times over coffee and he said, what do you think happened when we went from 8-1 to 9-8? <laughs> I 
I said, well, you just didn't cope with the pressure, mate. Nothing to do with the slower boat. Like, that, that obviously did count as well, but I think ultimately bad decisions were made when it really mattered. And um, so, you know, and I, I said, I said, well, you know, it was great. Everyone used to call the All Blacks, oh, chokers, <laughs> and now it's you guys. Thanks very much for taking it off us. But um, so it, it becomes critical that you, you build people that have got that capacity, and we coach that, you know. Like yeah. We coach mental skills because we believe it's so important, and everyone, like Big Brad Thorne, um, I don't know if you noticed him in a game, but he'd always get water bowls and pour them over his head. It wasn't because his head was hot. It was because he was telling his head, I'm overthinking all this, it's hot and it's red, I need to calm down, I need to get back and sort of be blue and composed, you know, and that was just a signal for him, but it was, that was a trained behaviour, and he'd learnt that, uh, and it helped him. Um, Richie, as simple as this, Richie, if he was struggling in a game, he, he knew where, he'd, all he'd do was shift where his focus was. If he was struggling, he'd be down here, and his eyes would be down there. If he stood up and looked, suddenly everything became clear to him. And like, but that was a trained skill that he had picked up and learned over time that if I'm down here, my focus is here. If I open myself up, I'm seeing all of this and I'm understanding what I need to do as a leader. So it's just lots of those, uh, I guess it's us having that um, belief that it's really important and then driving a really strong program around it to make, you know, give our guys those tools, if you like, in their toolbox. Yeah. So you're talking about um, the All Blacks looking to perform best under pressure and, and I think in... Um in chasing great Richie McCaw said I really only started and by the time they walked the first World Cup they won came around I only started enjoying it when I became under pressure I only became confident because mm -hmm. I trained myself until I came under pressure and he became better under pressure than he was not under pressure he enjoyed it more mm. and so f for the level that um, that Heartland sitting at I, I reckon the biggest, um, the thing we struggle with the most, I mean, you know, the fitness isn't there necessarily and the skill, and you've got a big wide range of ages, you've got young guys, older guys, all those sorts of things, but the most, but throughout all those groups is the ability to make decisions right on the spot and the whole game of rugby, even at our level, is quickened up. And, and you have to be able to make these quick decisions and that's where we, I think we struggle the most in schoolboy rugby, which is really, really quick. They, they have to be even quicker. And, they, and I think we struggle with that. So what, what, what are the key things that managers, team, well, coaches, teams, players need to be looking at to improve in that area? Uh, very, you know, amateur, and we haven't got all those resources, but that decision-making thing is the toughest thing <coughs> to get right, and that's, just, that's the difference between a good player and yeah. a really good player. How do you work on that? Uh, well, I couldn't tell you from a technical point yeah, of view because yeah, I, yeah. I don't deal with the game, but again, I go back to the fact that our, the driver for our whole organisation is about decision-making under pressure, so yeah. everything we do off the field is about that too. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you're an All Black and you turn up on Sunday and we've got a week's preparation, you don't get handed a, you don't get handed a plan for the week. No. You write the plan yourself because you've got to make a decision about what you need to do to be the best you can be. Now we're all there to help you with that, but we're not going to do it. <laughs> and so it's, you know, I think how we educate kids and that now, we, we sort of get, it's all, it's all given to us and it's too easy and we have to make it as hard as possible because come Saturday that's where you get tested as much. So we've got to keep testing them during the week and find ways and means of um, continuing to test them, keep asking them to make decisions um, create adversity in the environment so they're constantly having to adapt and adjust and it's not always the same. Um, we just do that all the time and we throw surprises in um, and that's, that's where they learn and it's in their face all the time, the pressure's always there um, and obviously at times we've got to take ourselves out of the bubble because you can't live like that all the time but there's a conscious effort to, to think about that and realise it's an important part. There's some, Amazing stuff being done around the game because that's from an analysis and a um, understanding of data and stuff. Now the, the tools we've got are unbelievable, um, but I think it, it starts if your environment's that's an area you want to improve. You've got to find ways on and off the field where people are tested and, and, and asked to make decisions themselves and not um, directed all the time. So, so, so do you think that because you talked about before where um, 
there was a, at times becoming a lack of enjoyment. You know, these are this guy's jobs. This is their livelihood. Our guys, you know, I like to think that they all play for fun. That's why we're playing amateur guys are playing, you know, whether they're eight or they're 53, you know. But so do you think that that sort of change makes it more enjoyable, putting that sort of pressure on and making them more responsible and all that? Does that make it, so has that made it a more enjoyable experience within the All Blacks or within those sorts of teams? Well, you have to ask them, but yeah. I think for, from, for from, where I'm, from where I'm sitting, <laughs> I reckon um, it's, it's no good just getting a pat on the back for a 5 out of 10 job and say, oh, you're doing a great job, but that's plastic, you know. Um, I think where, you get, where I get the biggest buzz is that, um, that I reach a level that I didn't think I could reach before. I'm going to feel way better about that than if I just am um, mediocre. And so for me, personally speaking, uh, I don't think I've even close to reaching my potential because there's just so much more I can learn. And that's what's blown me away about the environment and particularly the guys that have led it over the years, the Richies and those sort of guys of the world. There was just this insatiable appetite to want to be better all the time. Um, I'll share a story. In, I think it was at 2013, we went the first year of uh, professional team unbeaten, 13 straight. Remember when we smashed the Irish by uh, in the last minute, you know, <laughs> in that year? So the following summer we met, um, we met the leaders and we were talking about what's going to be the challenge this year, you know, we've just been unbeaten, so what's next? And I love those conversations where we decide what our next challenge is, because for you it's probably obvious, you've just got to win the next game, but it's got to be deeper than that. So we're in this room, right, and they're all sitting on their chairs and it's summer and you know, everyone's summered pretty well and they're sitting on the back of their chairs, are pretty happy. At that stage we'd gone 14 games unbeaten and we'd talked in years previous about trying to break the record for the most consecutive wins, I think it was 17 at that stage, and we'd got close a couple of times but failed and we said to the players, why? You know, why have we failed? If we're going to be the greatest of all time, surely we'd want to have that record, you know? And they said, oh, it just didn't mean much to us and... So um, management had talked before this meeting and uh, we said, okay, so we're all here together because we're getting ready for the 2014 season. In June, we're going to play the English. Three test matches. All right. So, um, so you're telling us now that, you know, if you don't really care about this record, we're going to lose a game against England because we've never made the record before. We're now on 14. If we win the three, we've equaled it, you know. And they're like, they suddenly went from the back of the seat to the front of the seat because it became their challenge, you know, and they... <coughs> They then took that on. Uh, similarly, and we were really concerned heading into 2015 World Cup, we had half of the squad had, run, had won a World Cup. And so when you've already got the gold medal in the back pocket, there's a tendency to maybe not quite work as hard, you know. And we were, we were quite concerned about that. We thought, how are we going to really get these guys that have been there before to be in the same level of motivation as the guys that were having their first crack at it? And... Um, Everyone was talking about back-to-back, -back, but we thought we needed to make the challenge bigger than that. We actually wanted to make the challenge back-to-back-to-back, -to -back -to -back so that if you're already, if you're finishing, if you're Makor, Mialamu, Nonu, in order to do the legacy the best you could do, you need to win in 15, so the next guys in 19 have an opportunity to go back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back. So, and because they believe so much in creating history and building legacy, that was something that became their challenge. And so suddenly Richie, Conrad, Ma, Kevy, they didn't want to let Sam Kane, Aaron Crude and, and all this, the, the guys that are going to be there at 19, Rito, they didn't want to let them down, they wanted them to have that opportunity. So um, creating a challenge for your group becomes really, really important and what you also, uh, what we've found works really well, you put that out there first and you, you imagine what it's going to look like and feel like and then you come back to where you are right now and you ask yourself some really difficult questions, what are the inconvenient facts, where are we right now? And what you'll find is there's quite a, might be a massive gap or maybe not be such a big gap, but if the, there will be a gap. And that's your opportunity. And um, that's something that this group's done really well and that, that, that like, it's like we have lots of drivers, but that's another, another way. Individually, you can ask the same thing of yourself, you know. What I ask myself every year, what, if I want to be the best manager, what do I want people to say about me in the, the year? You know, Sandy was this, that and that, okay. How am I going to get there? Am I there yet? No. What do I need to do? Right, I'm going to do it. And away you go. Simple way. So where, so, <laughs> yeah. so where are you at now? So where, where are the All Blacks at now? Because they've got a massive challenge. Well, depends on your point of view with the Lions coming and all that sort of stuff.
Yeah. But is that the main thing for this current uh, management team who are going to be sticking around until the next World Cup? Is this a stepping stone or or we just play this these next few games and have a crack at the Lions, which no one, not many guys get a crack at? Well, I mean, I think there's still, there's always that, um, there's the appetite in the team to create history all the time, you know, so the Lions series is a, a once in 12 year opportunity, so you, you want to do the best job you can and we specifically have put a, like a Rugby World Cup plan, if you like, around this series because of the importance of it and we want to get it right. Um, once we get through Lions, our focus will probably be towards 2019 in Japan and, and, and building right through to there. But um, yeah, right now it's, it's all Lions. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think Steve's very much looking forward to locking horns with Gat in the media every week and uh, having a crack. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain that the players are you know, really excited now that it's feels really close, you know. It's, I think they land in nine days and up to Whangarei and, and it'll all be on, so um, watch out. Yeah, so we got a uh, question over here, Dwayne. Old um, table over here. That sucks. Thank you. Um, I'm just interested to hear a little bit about the hierarchy of the management team um, and wondering if you could speak a little bit on um, <coughs> maybe who reports to who. So obviously someone like Steve um, fronts the media. Um, but I'm wondering if there's any reporting structure where they report through to you or, or where the buck stops. Um, and I'm wondering if you might have some stories about um, some run-ins that you've had with the media or the coaching staff have had with the media because that seems to be um, pretty candid from week to week. Uh, yeah, so um, we kind of have a group of four that run the team. Uh, Steve, Hanson, myself, Gilbert Anoka and um, Ian Foster. And we, we have a group we call a sweet spot. Um, and so we, each of myself, Ian and Gilbert, run one arm of the management team. So we're about 20 staff on the road. Uh, I look after the operations and the business. Gilbert looks after the well-being, which is all the, the players' needs, physical, mental, nutritional, etc. And Ian looks after the coaching. And Steve, um, I work mostly with Steve and with Graham. Steve's very different from Graham. Steve's greatest strength is he's um, really intuitive. Like he, he just, he's a guy that can walk into a room, he'd be a guy to turn up at an exam, have done no preparation and have figured out what the questions were, you know, he's just, there's something about him that's special, uh, he can just do that and it's annoying as anything, eh? when you're like a hard diligent worker like me, he does all the prep before you get there and he just rocks and he's got all the answers, so annoying but, but it's a great, it's a great strength because he's, he's just so good at it and so his best role with our, our group is to be that sort of helicopter over the top because he's, he, um, He's pretty abrasive and he's pretty direct. Uh, you need very thick skin uh, <laughs> and you don't want to take it personally. But um, that, again, that, uh, what I've learnt in uh, this team, and it's taken me a while, is that um, you've got to be a little bit uncomfortable to be successful. Uh, and if it gets comfortable, you probably don't arrive at the right answers because you're not really testing things. And Steve makes it pretty uncomfortable. Uh, and I think that's good and that's why we are successful. So um, personally, you've got to balance that up and you can't live like that all the time, it's hard work. Graham was complete opposite. Graham, um, so currently I, I report to Steve too, actually the Chief Executive, and, and I report to Steve Hanson, so we, it's sort of a shared thing. Uh, prior to Steve starting with Graham Henry, him and I were um, sort of same level, technically I was his boss. Uh, it was pretty nerve wracking, uh, I remember Graham got appointed and uh, I decided to put my hand up for the All Black job and um, there was quite a bit of pay stuff in the papers about who the candidates would be, you know, it was Sean Fitzpatrick and Andy Dalton and Andy Hayden, and my name wasn't even you know, mentioned. And, and we got down to the final three, and um, it was Andy Dalton, Andy Hayden and myself, and um, something came out in the papers, and, you know, Andy Dalton, Andy Hayden and Darren who. Um, I went to the final interview um, with, um, with a four-person panel, uh, and at the end of the interview, the chairman said to me, oh, I just want to make an apology because it's been leaked in the papers who the final candidates are, and you know, I'm really sorry for that. And so I looked at the four gentlemen in the room and I said, remember when I rang you four months ago before this process and I asked you what you were looking for 
in terms of an all black manager, you know, what were the qualities you wanted and the skill sets and, and so on. And, and you told me you wanted someone that had experience and, and had worked as a manager before. I said, you've just confirmed to me now that Andy Dalton and Andy Hayden are the other two candidates, because I read the paper uh, this morning. Neither of them have managed the rugby team. And I knew at this stage, I, I'm reasonably shy, I was pretty shy back then and didn't, I think they were concerned that I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't speak up or say what needed to be said at the right time. So I thought, I've got to put it all out here, you know, I've got to be brave. And I said, well, given that you told me who the other two are and I've got no management experience, I guess I've got the job. <laughs> and uh, you can see, like, the jaws dropped and uh, there was just this, this, this horrible silence, like this room tonight. No, <laughs> it was just this horrible silence so and nothing was said, so I just got up and walked out. <laughs> anyway, five minutes later, I was sitting in the foyer, I was like sweating, I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, I'm just, <laughs> I'm really blowing this. Uh, one of the men on the panel was a, a wonderful man, uh, DJ Graham, former All Black captain, uh, Principal Walken Grammar, uh, amazing man. And he, he's very direct, DJ, like, you know, he's very black and white. And he walked past me and he just gave me this massive wink, you know, and I thought, he probably of anyone wanted me to be, you know, just direct and strong in that moment. So uh, yeah, that was, yeah, I've probably gone way off track, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Anything else on that? Yeah. Hey, g'day. Um, I just want to talk about your, your managing. So you had to manage a, a team, you have to be really organised. Is there a kind of like a, a technique or something that you do to make sure that you are always organised, always tick all the boxes, um, do everything you need to do? Is there kind of something... You, you, you do to, to make sure that happens? What don't we know? <laughs> well, I think um, I've got a great team, you know, like I'm not, I don't day to day organise the buses and the hotels and the planes and I've got a great team of people that do that and I think over the, what I'm lucky is that over 14 years there's not much I haven't seen now and you, you kind of know what's going to hit you and uh, I'm much more relaxed about getting all the, the building blocks in place in time because it's just a process and in the end we'll get it right when it, when it matters. Um, I look, there's some wonderful tools now uh, online and so on that you can use that allow you to do all that and we've got a great, you know, um, the, the lady that heads all our sort of, does all our logistics, she's been with us since 2005 so her knowledge base is really deep. Um, my logistics guy that does all my freight and all that sort of stuff He's been there six or seven years, so you've got a lot of experience. And for me, it's about just giving them the rope to get out and get all those boxes ticked. And then between us, as a triangle, we've just got to be super tight and make sure we've got everything done. Uh, and I'm pretty relentless with them about getting things done because um, what I do know in high performance, it's about really small margins and little things matter. Um, and even off-field, little things matter because... Um, People used to say to me, oh, you do too much for them, you know, you guys, you put their bags in their room. But if you look at that purely from a performance, through a performance lens, what's the point of our players lifting 100 bags before they play a match? Is that going to help them on the field? Like, it might be a good thing to do, but if we can find another system or another way that means they're fresher and more ready to play and they play better, then isn't that more important? And so everything we do... We, we think about that. Um, look, I, we have a massive commercial program. We have you know, massive sponsors who have big demands and expectations on us. Um, but if someone wants to run a coaching clinic, I don't want the players running around for 30 minutes, full noise and pulling a hamstring and then not being able to play. So w we think about that all the time. And so operations is just a vehicle to drive the bus. And um, I think what I, my role really is to make sure that that has very little impact on them being prepared to play and play at their best. Uh, so ticking all the boxes, to me, ticking the boxes is a task. What's more important is that the culture's right. So I'll give you an example of a tick box. I've organised a bus that's due here at 5 o'clock to take us to the game. It's now 5.15 and the bus hasn't arrived. Okay? If the culture's great, we'll just adapt and get on with it. If the culture's poos, we'll... <laughs> that'll probably define how we play that day. So that, I kind of look at it in a different way. You know, I don't, while it's great to get all these 
things ticked and in place uh, and they're important and they're efficient, uh, it can't be at the expense of performance being the number one thing and, and the environment being right, you know, for the people. So things are going to go wrong. Yeah, they always do. Yep. Do you remember uh, Johannesburg uh, a few years ago? We, we have to write a sheet out of all the players' names and we give it to the um, match officials. <laughs> and, uh, and I made a really bad cut and paste error. <laughs> I usually used the sheet from the week before, changed the date and changed the names, but I forgot one name. And um, so the game started and Andrew Hall was on the sheet number two. He, knew he got subbed and Dane Coles ran on the field, but the person's name on the sheet was Kevin Mialamu. So the referee stopped the game and pulled me over and asked me what had happened. Luckily, uh, the Springbok captain, uh, Jean de Villiers, I'd got to know really well over the years. I'd been on a couple of flights to South Africa and he'd happened to be injured and I'd sat next to him and we got on really well and I'd been to his house a couple of times and, that and so I walked out onto the field because the coach, coach said to me, they stopped the game and Steve, I'm on the earpiece and Steve answered to me, what's going on down there, cock? <laughs> I said, oh we've got a little bit of a problem Steve but I'll, I'll sort it out, he says, best you get on the field quick. So <laughs> ran out and I knew the referee really well too, again it's all about, you know, Great relationships as a manager is critical. You know that in the police. And um, so I just honest with no, I said, oh, look, mate, I made a complete stuff up and I put the wrong name on the sheet, but, you know, I wasn't trying to... And in the meantime, the Springbok manager's just sort of here and he's pushing, trying to get in to, to say his piece. I was sort of like just blocking him out. And, uh, and John de Villiers gave me a wink and said, ah, come on, let's just get on with it. And the ref goes, yeah, away we go. So, uh, yeah, I made a big mistake. And uh, I walked into changing rooms and the first person I saw was Andrew Hoare and he had a, a big jug of beer there <laughs> I was like, here you go son <laughs> I was like, well just before I do that Hoare because I like to have a bit of banter with Hoare I said, now talk to me about that first 10 minutes I think you were defending out by the winger and that other prop ran around you popped the ball to Habana, he scored 5 points what's going on there? what about that missed tackle? Drunk it himself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Any, yeah. Hey, uh, Shandy. Um, it was awesome seeing in uh, the 2011 and 2015 campaign the involvement of uh, Willie Apiata uh, with the team. Uh, my question is just how did that relationship come about between uh, the All Blacks and him? Um, what sort of things did he share with the boys um, and what kind of influence he had? And how important is it to have uh, someone outside of the All Blacks, but also an inspirational leader? I think back to, to 95 with Nelson Mandela in, in South Africa. Um, would you better share with us uh, Willie's influence with the All Blacks? Yeah. Oh, so I guess quickly on Willie first was um, when he got his VC, um, his commanding officer rang us and said, I've got this young soldier, he's just been given the Victoria Cross. Uh, he's now going to be a public figure, he's got no idea what that means. Could he come down and meet Richie and Dan? So um, he came down to training one day. It was a public training. And um, I was walking him down onto the field. And there was just like quite a lot of people there. And um, Willie sort of disappeared. And I saw him over there signing some things. And he was taking a long time, like sort of a group of 10 people. I was, like, I was looking at my watch. It's been half an hour with these 10 people. And I went over and I watched him sign. And he wrote like his whole name, you know, William Apiata. And I was like this long on the ball, took up the whole ball. I said, bro. Number one lesson in public figure, quick signature, you know, <laughs> VC or something like that. Tana used to just be a T. So um, that sort of started from there and he, um, he came in then and we said, oh, we'd love you to come in. In 2011, uh, we used him and Jock Hobbs, who was dying at the time of leukaemia, and just to give that little bit of extra emotion. And so he told his story. Um, I remember one day he came in and pretty weepy, you know, he grew the big beard at the, in the World Cup. And uh, <laughs> Willie came in, shaved. Uh, he was clean shaven that day, which was unusual for Willie. Uh, and he looked down the front, and I swear to God, Pity Weepu looked just like Willie Arthur did uh, when he was in the SAS. He was like, oh, you know, what have we got here? Um, so from then, um, Wayne Smith became really good, uh, developed a relationship with Willie, and he decided that um, our defence in our game, he was going to use an inspirational figure, and he wanted to use Willie. And so we actually named our defence uh, um, Woodamu after Willie. And so Wayne went out and sat with Willie one day at his home and just interviewed him about life and his philosophies and 
a lot of that we used every week just to drive our defence. Uh, we invited him over to the World Cup in 2015, uh, and pretty special moment I think for the semi-final. Uh, we asked him to present the jerseys, so normally someone speaks at that. Uh, so we, we came back from a little run round and we had the chairs set up with all the jerseys. Everyone came and sat down. Willie walked to the front of the room, he had his, his number ones on, all his medals, and he just stood in the room, said nothing. And uh, it, was, oh, it was amazingly powerful. Uh, and he just looked at each of the boys one by one, gave them a nod, and um, then they just walked up, got their jersey and walked out, and uh, said nothing but said everything. You know, uh, it was, was incredible. Um, and look, well, I think we're always open to learning and seeking ideas from others. Um, you just got to get the balance right. You can't do it every week. The game's not played on emotion. The game's a process. There's a job to do. You do that job, then you do the next job. You do the next. Someone said to me, emotion's like smashing a glass on a wall. It has a moment and it's gone. And that's the same in the game. When you really boil it down, I've got to make a tackle, now I've got to get up, now I've got to get in that position, now I've got to do this. It's just task after task after task and not getting deflected from the task. So we're really careful uh, times when we use it because we feel we need to give ourselves a lift uh, and it's relevant to that week or uh, we often we often look at history where we are. Like we go to France every year, we play in Europe in November, it's around the commemorations of the war, you know, it's Armistice Day. So it's a great way for us to reconnect with our men that went in battle there and that tell that story and understand that more and build that real strong connection. So. Uh, from time to time. Probably the funniest goal we ever had in uh, was an Italian um, fencer. You know, like couldn't speak a word of English. It was the most funny half hour I've ever spent. <laughs> it was hilarious, but he had a great story. He won a silver medal at the Olympics and uh, it, was, it was very funny. So you've been, we've been lucky we meet some great people. Any, any other questions on the floor down here, Blake? Uh, look over my shoulder. G'day, how are you? Good, thanks. Hey, um, just a, a last one, I guess. Um, like with uh, sport and business, you can uh, be riding a high, but you also know that something's going to come along and kick in the ass pretty quickly. How long do you let uh, people... So how do you celebrate that high without becoming sort of complacent? It may be a coaching thing I'm talking about here, but know, you know, so. generally it's... Um, you know, it, 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 it could be business, you could, you know, be going really, really well, then you lose a good client or you lose a good staff member or whatever, and in sport, the same thing. Things are tracking really well, and then Japan comes along and kicks your butt. Um, do you celebrate the success? Do you really celebrate the success, or do you just sort of hold it back a little bit and not become too complacent? Yeah, I guess we're a little bit different from a business in that we don't just wait till the end of the year to get our, you know, P&L. Um, that's still important for the business too, by the way, but... Um, from a team perspective, you know, celebrating success in rugby looks a lot different from what it used to look like. Um, and what we used to do is not acceptable now. And um, so we have to do it differently. Um, the game, the expectations on the team are so much higher now that we can't afford to have a dip and have a drop. So uh, when you play two tests on two weekends, uh, we know if our guys go and fill themselves up on beer, uh, uh, that's a day we've lost in terms of our preparation for the next week. So in, in our environment, it's been more about saying, here's the whole year. We, we know we're going to have to celebrate success somewhere you know, if, we're, if we're good enough. Um, these are the best opportunities, you know, rather than we actually start, we have to prescribe it because um, you know, we might play in one country and the next week we're 12 hours further around the other side of the world. Uh, so we have to really, we have to think and be reasonably strategic about it. Um, in terms of wait, waiting for that kick up the bum, I think that comes, that's, that's our job in terms of our preparation. We've got to build contingency, we've got to be expecting the unexpected all the time and we're not doing our job if we're not looking hard at that. Um, there'll be the things that come that we don't expect but we've got to have the tools to cope with that in the moment, in the time, all the time because as one of the guys asked around the media, th those sort of things. I love the race to beat the media to the story. And, and we actually proactively put the story out versus react to something that's gone wrong. So I guess you know, in that sense we're always constantly having to have eyes in the back of our head and predict what's going to happen, have buffers, 
have contingencies and have thought all those things through. So that's the, I guess from where we sit, that's how we try to manage it. Yeah. One more. One more. Oh, awesome. A light-hearted moment, uh, Darren. Um, have you got an inside story to us about that bug in the hotel room in Sydney that we should all know about? <laughs> uh, Perhaps you could elaborate on that as All Black Manager. No, well, I'm the chief witness, so... Yeah, I, I don't Nothing know. Nothing for the press at the moment. Pardon? Nothing for the press at the moment. No, no, I don't. Uh, it's uh, one of the most bizarre things I've ever... Um, well, to actually see it, for a start, was blew me away. Um, but we're no closer to knowing what happened, and um, so we're just letting the court court stuff happen, really. Um, like I don't think Checker put it in there, <laughs> but I don't know how it got in there, you know. So um, it's like personally, it's, it's it's really difficult when you're when you're at the top and you've been for a long time. Uh, you do get a little bit paranoid um, because you're being chased, you know, and. You're trying to build new Everest all the time. And I mean, Eddie Jones, how many times does he mention All Blacks? Like every single time he speaks. Um, everyone's watching us, trying to learn how we do it. And I, I try to, like, I've got three cops in my coaching team, so you can imagine the paranoia there. Um, but it's about trying to be careful and not paranoid. Um, so it's like any business, you know, you, you've got something that's special, you, you want to look after it because that's. It's driving your success and it's driving your economic engine. So uh, we have to do that and we have to be... I hate the amount of time I have to spend on security, but uh, I fear if I don't, I'm letting the side down and um, we're just going to give away something that we don't want to give away. Um, and you can only do that so far, but it's, uh, it's tough now. Like um, the, the world in sport has is, is changed and um, the amount of corruption in sport is... I hope in rugby it, it doesn't happen. And I believe rugby's, you know, of all the sports, reasonably pure. But um, we go to Europe, I tell you, it's changing. You know, um, we had uh, betting syndicates uh, that tried to make money on us and through our players at the last World Cup. Uh, we caught bookies in our hotel. So the world's changing. And it's sad because I think people look through sport with a different lens now and you're never quite sure. But... Um, you know, hopefully in rugby that's not going to be the case because I, I, I believe that it's still the pure game and people play it for the right reasons and, and it's great still that you know we play the spring box and we're still going to have a beer with them uh, and that's to me that's I love I love that part of the game that that still exists and we get out there and we smash ourselves and then we sit down like you know good men and, and have a good yarn about it so uh, other sports I've been to some of the biggest English football clubs and they're just toxic environments. They're awful places. I would, I, someone said to me, I offer you more than money I could do it to go and work at Chelsea or Man U, I wouldn't go near it. It's just awful. So well, that's what I love about rugby. It's special and it's got its way and that's still, we're hanging on to keeping that as much as we can despite all the other professional pressures that we face. Yeah. I think it's really... Um, <coughs> Good to hear that you sort of try to keep the fun and and that sort of celebration part <coughs> in, in footy. And it's really the only reason a lot of people around here play footy. That's it. There mm. is nothing else. We've got plenty of guys who want to go on. We've got young kids at Boys High that want to have a crack at the big time down the road. And we've got some young guys that have gone on, you know. We've got old Brody playing over in J playing at World Cup in Japan and, and he started here. And, um, Malakai Ravulu played for Fiji for years and played a couple of World Cups and Heartland is a, is a stepping stone and for some guys if that's what they want to do if it hasn't worked out somewhere else get back into Heartland and have a crack or, or all those different pathways so but the main thing we do is have fun and, and it's because that's their motivator there's no money there's still the financial strife at home there's still the babies and all the drama so it's really good to hear that you guys are trying to have fun and, and, and have a go. So, um, and, I, and I applaud you for that and I hope that continues because we want our All Blacks to enjoy themselves and keep playing. It's Thank awesome you. to hear that. It's Thank fantastic. You. Yes.